morning to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, or Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of our church, we're just so blessed. Again, you have shared with us during our Sunday School Hour. Today's lesson is for April 24th, and it's entitled Experiencing Liberation. It's taken from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And our key verse comes from John 8, 36, from the New King James Version. It reads, Therefore, if the Son of Man makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Uh, we have three goals in this lesson. One, we will examine what Jesus meant when he spoke of slavery and freedom. Two, we will examine how people are enslaved by modern society. And third, finally, we will celebrate living in the freedom that lies in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. What a wonderful lesson. It's a little heavy in theology, so we'll make sure to take our time going through it. But I really believe it will help us to understand that we have to make a clear decision in our lives. Will we follow Christ or will we follow the world? And there is no middle ground. So hopefully today's lesson will encourage us and strengthen us in our walk with him. As always, if you are new to this channel, please make sure that you subscribe and turn on your notifications that you can get our information as we send it out. We are using our church channel to send out weekly Bible class lessons each Wednesday night and our morning worship on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And of course, the Sunday school lessons at 9.30. So make sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications. We'll begin with prayer and we'll jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to share in your word. Father, we recognize that we've fallen short. We, pray, we thank you for brand new graces and brand new mercies each and every day. Father, help us to see you clearer so we will better understand what you would have us to do in our lives. Also, help us to understand that each and every one of us must make a choice, must make a stand. Will we serve you or will we serve the Lord or will we serve the world? And our experience, our knowledge has shown us, our faith has taught us that we are so much better serving you than doing our own thing and following the world. So help us to understand your plan and your will for our lives. Help us to be encouraged and strengthened through this lesson. Bless each and every person that is sharing with us. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, in chapter 7 and 8 of John, there is a great debate over Jesus amongst the Jewish elders. The work, the teachings, the ministry of Jesus was very uncomfortable for the elders of the Jewish uh, temples of the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They just didn't like what Jesus was doing. And they went as far as to per uh, question his birthplace and verbally wondering out loud if a prophet could come from Galilee, recognizing that none of the prophets had came from there before. Uh, Jesus is forced to defend himself, and he theologically explains that he is indeed the light of the world. Initially, the works of Jesus in his time and in his authority were questioned, but now the commentary is surrounding Jesus uh, and the focus is on his theology, who he claims to be, what he claims to do and the authority by which he claims to do it under. Coupled with a sense of misunderstanding and the indignation of the Jewish leaders, it creates an argumentative atmosphere where the animosity towards Jesus is highlighted throughout the Gospel of John. So John does a really good job of kind of highlighting the issues that Jesus uh, encountered during his ministry. Our lesson is broken into four parts. We'll be reading through John chapter 8, and I'll be sharing from the New King James Version. First, portion of our lesson comes from verses 31 and 32 in John chapter 8, and it reads, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The first portion of our lesson is entitled Freedom in Christ. So during the time of the ministry of Jesus, there was a schism developing between the Jewish uh, elders and the Jewish Christians that believed Jesus was indeed their promised Messiah. His teachings were a threat to the Old Testament system that was not only embraced by the elders, but in most cases they had converted it for their own personal enrichment. Dating back to the days of the Old Testament, it was not uncommon for leaders of the temple, the Jewish leaders, the priests, to act selfishly, from taking extra portions of sacrifice for themselves to even having their own black market sacrificial system that allowed them to sell their own uh, animals at a highly inflated cost. Those were really common practices uh, that we saw even Jesus kind of stop when he went into the temple when he declared that his house would not be uh, a den of thieves. This low, uh, uh, and so Jesus during his, excuse me, Jesus during his earthly ministry 
he often corrected misinterpreted understandings and directed his followers to believe in him as the Messiah. Uh, and then he, of course, in this part of the lesson, he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This loaded command not only lifted Jesus up as an authority and God himself, but it also caused a weakened belief in the old way of doing things, which was not at all embraced by the Jewish elders. They really saw that Jesus was coming to disrupt the system that was in place. It created a charged atmosphere where each and every word of Jesus had become to become, has started to become dissected in hopes of proving a charge of blasphemy or exposing Jesus as a fraud. And if we look back at our lesson from last week, we'll see that it was in fact the charge of blasphemy that Jesus was arrested and convicted and eventually crucified for. Much like the society in which we live in today, simple statements or thoughts about Jesus were ripped apart in hopes of catching uh, or finding a, a way to prove him to be dishonest. Uh, it seems like today, every single time a major political figure speaks, the news outlets are looking for hitting meetings in order to discredit the speaker or to push their own profit-driven agendas. And we've seen from time to time again from all the major news networks, I would say just the bit six or so, OAN, Newsmax, MSNBC, Politico, Fox, and of course CNN, the major six news outlets are all driven by pushing their own agenda in, in hopes of reaching their audience. A, a, a well-hidden fact, and I don't know how it's not public knowledge or at least or routinely shared is that Fox News was oftentimes sued for libel or for misinformation. Their legal defense that actually uh, allowed them to win the court cases, specifically dealing with Sean Hannity, was that this is just entertainment and no one in their right mind would expect to consider this news. And so even the publishers, the authors of some of these outrageous statements, both on the left and the right, have admitted in open court that they're news programs isn't in fact news and it's meant to cater towards their their listeners towards their audience and of course towards their uh, their uh, the people that pay for their advertising fees their advertisers so uh with a general lack of education and an absence of available resources the jewish christians of the time again 2000 years ago before internet before printed books at a time when only the jewish elders and the priests were really the ones that understood were able to read scripture within the temple. There weren't really uh, many copies of scripture outside of the temple. They were, these Jewish Christians were put in a position where they would have to hear competing messages and hope that God would guide them to a correct understanding of his word. Unfortunately, this same practice continues to happen today, even with so such an abundance of resources and material for Christian education. Uh, just a simple YouTube search will provide countless videos of sermons, teachings, and ministries misinterpreting the word of God for people's own selfish reasons. I can't begin to tell you how often I receive an email or come across a video or article outlining or detailing how a church or ministry leader intentionally deceived others for sexual, financial, or other reasons, selfish reasons that have nothing to do with salvation or being of help to, towards others. Here in the text, we see Jesus encouraging his followers to not fall prey to the actions of those that seek to pervert the word of God and instead to abide in his word. Now, to abide in the word of God means to live, dwell, and make a home in the word of God. The theologian Tasker says that it means to welcome it, to be at home with it, and to live with it continuously so it becomes a permanent part of the believer's life. It literally means that you do it so much, that you live in it so much, that you abide by it and that you follow it so much that it guides it is your way of life then jesus goes on to illustrate that if we are to abide in the word of god there is a consequence we will know the truth and that truth will indeed set us free i've always believed there are three sides to every story and i'm going to use me as a person that's on my side there's your side and then there's the truth unfortunately as flawed creatures as imperfect humans we tend to shape things based on our own perspective, our own experience, and unfortunately, our own desired outcome. Even the most honest eyewitness will often overlook an important detail or simply miss the full picture. 
but there is only one truth, and we have seen through rapid availability of audio and video recordings how even well-intentioned individuals can sometimes unintentionally op- obfuscate the truth or uh, provide it in an unclear fashion. When it comes to the Word of God, there is no hidden meaning or special revelation, but the only the truth, but only the truth, and the truth cannot be changed or distorted regardless of the person or the reason. Jesus says that the only way to be tr- free is to have the truth, and the truth only lies in him and his word. Now, this freedom is not freedom for pain or debt or even incarceration, but rather it's freedom from sin. And perhaps the biggest mistake, uh, but the biggest trick of the enemy is to convince us that the freedom that we desire as Christians is freedom from the pains of this world. However, we must realize that we're just traveling through. I shared a story uh, uh, last week uh, about when I go to hotels, I don't really like making the room my own. I know sometimes people bring pictures, people bring personal items from home, but I, I really just bring my suitcase. I put what little clothes I have in the drawer, and I do whatever I can to make sure that I'm not getting too comfortable. The reason why is no matter how nice the hotel is, I'm just passing through, and I have a destination. I have a home get back to. And so no matter how nice or how large the room might be, I don't really get too comfortable in it because I know it's just temporary. That's the mindset that we need to have as Christians. The enemy's trick is to convince us that this temporary a place that we have on earth, however the years might be, even the strongest of us, what, 100, 105 years. So these 105 years at best that we have to temporarily pass through this place fails in comparison when we look at the bigger picture that for all of eternity, will reside at the presence of the Lord. So the freedom that we're looking for is not a temporary freedom to free us from the pains of this world, but an eternal freedom to free us from the consequences of sin. Uh, Regardless if we can't physically see the shackles, each and every one of us are enslaved to sin because we were born in it. It's our sinful nature. Uh, Absent the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives, we are each marked with the sins of our thoughts, of our words, and of our actions. The Bible makes it clear the wages of sin is death. But Jesus came not only to defeat death, but to give us the power to overcome sin in our lives because the power that lies in him uh, gives us a strength to do what we cannot do on our own. It doesn't necessarily prevent us, excuse me, from sinning in the future, but it gives us the power to overcome the consequences of sin and live a life that turns away from the world and turns towards Jesus Christ. This freedom is a real and lasting change in the life of the believer, and it shows that we are no longer bound to uh, this world, and we can even live a better life here on earth while pushing towards the eternal life granted to those that believe in the work of Jesus Christ as both our Savior and our Lord. He saves us from our sins. So Jesus was just letting the people know that the, the freedom that you're looking for is not what I've come to do. I've come to give you such a better gift. And oftentimes we sell ourselves short trying to get what we want instead of what someone has for us. And uh, I've, I've come to understand what God has for me is always better than what I could ever have for myself. And I've just come to trust and believe that God's way is better than my way in my life. So we see the freedom in Christ, but we jump down to verses 33 and 34, and we see misunderstood freedom. John chapter 8, 33 and 34, again, reading from New King James, it says, they answered him. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So Jesus' words definitely struck a nerve with the Jewish elders who quickly reminded Jesus that they were free men, descendants of Abraham. They have never been slaves in bondage to anyone. Oh, how we look to minimize our circumstances for the sake of our own egos. Throughout history, the descendants of Abraham have found themselves in Egyptian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Persian captivity. Even scripture shows us that how all of Israel was forced to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar with only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refusing to bow, which caused them to be punished by being thrown into the fiery furnace. There is scripture after scripture, book after book, that highlights the the captivity that Israel found themselves in all based on their disobedience to God. Even now, at the time of this lesson, though technically free, the Romans have occupied Jerusalem. They took over the land, making the Jews a minority in their own land. The language was changed where they weren't allowed to speak Hebrew anymore. They were forced to use Greek. 
and then they were forced to pay heavy taxes towards the support of the Roman Empire. And so this idea that they were free men is absurd to say the least, and it really goes to show how people try to shape their own situation for their own good. Listen, in the world in which we live in today, uh, this is, can simply be described as fake news. Uh, but when we have a a leader of one of the most powerful uh, nuclear empowered countries right now lying to the entire world uh, and making up an excuse to go to war against a democratic country that did nothing against them, and no one is really stepping up and helping to put an end to it. We're just kind of passing uh, legislation that limits their ability to spend outside of their country. It's really shameful because we know it's a lie. The entire world knows it's a lie, but there's really a limited amount that we can do in hopes of avoiding a third world war. And so there's, there's really no historical account of Jewish history uh, that would ever arrive at the conclusion that the descendants of Abraham were never in bondage to anyone. Or perhaps these leaders use like linguistic tricks and a revisionist history to arrive at their conclusion, and they basically lie to Jesus' face trying to uh, counter the words of Christ when he says that they have the ability to be free. Now, regardless how they tried to spin it, they went so far away from the understanding of what Jesus meant when explaining freedom that they might as well have been in an entirely different situation. It was really like an apples to oranges comparison. And much like the Jews who cheered Jesus during the triumphal entry during our lesson two weeks ago, and much like Pontius Pilate, who sought to prevent a political uprising by locking the way, locking away the body of Jesus in last week's lesson, most of creation misinterpreted Jesus' mission on earth. They were hoping to reestablish these Jewish elders, hoping to reestablish the great kingdom that David and Solomon once reigned over. Uh, whether they were simply hoping to rid themselves of the political oppressors and the, and the persons of the Roman Empire. Many assumed that Jesus had come to provide a political freedom uh, that had escaped Israel due to their disobedience over the past thousand plus years. But Jesus gave to give Jesus, excuse me, came to give life, and he came to to set us free from the penalty of sin, something that we would never be able to do within our own power. He responds to them by stating that whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. Now, this statement means so much because it not only highlights the effect of one's life who willfully sins, but it also shows that that person effectually rejects God when they choose to sin uh, at the same time. It's easy to look at sin as a temporary abandonment of principle, but in actuality, when we choose to sin, we willfully accept or choose in our life that God's way is not good enough and we would rather be a part of the world and to do what God has commanded for us to do. I always remember when I came back home from college, my father uh, allowed, allowed me to come back to the family home, but he said that in that house, there's only one man in the house. I could stay as long as I wanted, as long as I followed his rules. I thought the statement was absurd. I was grown, and I was able to make my own decisions, and I wondered how could my father justify preventing me from being a man free to do what I wanted. But I quickly realized that even though I was free to do what I wanted outside the house. The provision and the protection that the house provided was more than I was able to provide for myself. And I was left, in, I was left with an option to get in line with my father or to try to make it on my own. Now, thankfully, my father was patient and he assisted me into growing into the man that I am today. But I will never forget the theme of his message. You are free to do things your way, but not here in this house. As Christians, Jesus is telling us the same thing. We are free to do whatever we want. However, we can't be children of God if we are disobedient to God's word. There are two options in life. Who will we serve? Will it be God or will it be man? And each and every one of us needs to make a decision and live with the consequences of that decision, which will either be the blessings of God or the curses of this world. The teacher's edition shares that Paul wrote that sin is an open and persistent rebellion against God. It's literally deciding that I'm going to do what I want to do, even though I know God commands me to do different. We not only embrace the lies of this world when we sin, but we simultaneously reject the truth of God's word by choosing to ignore it and disobey it in our lives. When we sin, we move outside the will of God and fall subject to that sin, literally becoming controlled by that sin and no longer controlled by God. Our job as Christians is to repent. 
to pray that the Holy Spirit and God's word reveal sin in our lives and then subsequently turn away from that sin and turn towards God, freeing ourselves from the shackle that had us bound. I know a lot of times when we look at the definition of repentance, we think it simply means to apologize, tell God we're sorry, but that is not good enough. It means to turn away from that sin and turn towards God. The best physical illustration can come with Lot when he was able to free, flee from Sodom and Gomorrah when God decided to destroy it. He told them to flee and don't look back. And his wife, unfortunately, looked back and she, turning away from God and turning back towards the sin, she was immediately turned into a pillar of salt. Now, thankfully, God isn't striking us dead now like he did in those days. But how many of us would be pillars of salt right now if we were honest and admitted that when God revealed sin in our lives, when he gave us the opportunity to escape from sin and move out of the things that he does not want us to do, we willfully and intentionally went back and did the things we knew we had no business doing. I can testify right now from big things that I wouldn't even dare to mention to small things like dieting and sleep that I know God wants me to do better. He shows me how to do better, reveals how I do wrong, and yet I willfully continue to do what I know I should not do. So we see the freedom in Christ. We see misunderstood freedom. But when we jump down to verses 35 and 36, we see that freedom is found in Jesus alone. John chapter 8, 35 and 36 reads, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So here Jesus lifts up one of the most important tenets of our Christian faith. Regardless of your heritage, your church affiliation, your ancestors, even your work for Christ, regardless how much scripture you know, how well you preach, how gifted you are in praying or singing, each and every one of us must choose Christ for ourselves. I have some extremely kind friends, and those relationships have opened doors for me that I would not or may not have been able to open up on my own, at least at the times in which they were open. I don't even know where to begin and listen to the opportunities I have received and the blessings that I simply stumbled into because someone invited me or allowed me to tag along or join them on their journey. But there is no one, no, excuse me, no and one in heaven. Uh, none of us will be able to open up a side door. We won't be able to vouch for someone. Uh, we won't be able to use our connections to get someone else in. The truth is that we are each saved individually by the grace of God through the work of Christ. And each one of us individually must embrace and believe in that work in order to be saved. However, if each and every one of us or any of us individually reject the work of Christ, then we will be cast into hell for all of eternity. Here, Jesus reminds the Jewish elders that he, being the Son of God, has a permanent place in heaven. It is not only where he is headed after his earthly ministry, but it is from whence he came. Whereas the servants of God are welcome into heaven only if we, the servants, fall in line with the commands of the master. About two years ago, right before the COVID pandemic, we were going through the book of Leviticus as a church for our Bible studies. And throughout that book, we looked at the different laws in which the children of Israel had to follow. Uh, we see that the servants of the children of Israel were treated just as well as children. They were fed and clothed, and it was against the law to treat them any differently. However, if a servant defied the master or did not follow the instructions of the master, the master was well within his right to put the servant out of the house, allowing them to fend for themselves. Jesus reminds the Jewish elders that God, in fact, invited Israel into heaven when he looked down and chose Abraham to be the father of the, of the, of the nation of Israel. And that Israel's obedience and submission to God allows them to walk in and receive the invitation. Now, I once made a reservation, I remember, at a high-end restaurant, and it required that I pay for my meal before I got there uh, when I booked the reservation. I was excited, but I did not realize that there was a dress code and that there was no menu for the reservation for the restaurant. When I uh, About two days before, I decided to look at the menu so I could see how, uh, how much everything was going to cost decide what I was going to order. And it simply said that the chef will prepare an eight to 10 course meal that they're sure I'm going to like. Uh, I was only able to eat what the chef felt like cooking and I had to dress the way that they wanted me to. I was outraged. You can't tell me what to wear and what to eat. They replied when I emailed them that they would be happy to give me my deposit back and they would welcome someone that was on the waiting list to join because the restaurant was popular and the waiting list was long. 
I reluctantly agreed to follow their rules. I put on what they told me I had to put on, and I ate what they cooked for me. And I must admit that it was probably some of the best food that I've ever eaten in my life. The only re- reason or the only way I was able to get that great meal was by following the instructions, and I'm glad I did because the food was so much better than any other option I could have found on my own. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom of heaven is very much the same way. If we want to enter into God's presence of all for all of eternity, we must enter his way. Only by submitting to his word and embracing his son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior and our Lord. Jesus clarifies that only the Son of God can make us free. And if we are declared free through the work of Jesus, our freedom is both guaranteed and eternal. So we see freedom in Christ. We see misunderstood freedom, and we see freedom found in Jesus alone. But finally, we conclude our lesson by Abraham's descendants obey. John chapter 8, verses 37 and 38 reads, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. So Jesus concludes by showing the difference between between being a descendant of Abraham and being the children of Abraham. As descendants of Abraham, these Jewish elders assumed that they had inherited the promised outcome based on their heritage and their ethnicity and not their choices. But Jesus reminds them that as descendants of Abraham, they should follow in the ways of Abraham and submit to the will of God in their lives. Sometimes when I say something or when I do something, my friends, my family member, those that know my family, they'll comment that they can see my mother or they can see my father. You act just like your grandfather. They see a reflection of my ancestors in my actions, in my uh, in my movements, in my facial expressions, in my laugh. The way I act, it reflects the, the what has been passed down from my ancestors, and it illustrates that I'm one of their descendants because they can see similarities in us. Unfortunately, we don't always get the best of our ancestors, and sometimes we inherit their uh, bad habits just as well as we do their good habits. The same way we don't embrace behaviors and practices that are not beneficial to us, we should also not embrace spiritual characteristics that don't belong in the life of a Christian. So many of us treat the church the way we do because we were taught to treat it that way. So many of us right now, uh, I I, I say this all the time, and just bear with me for a second, I'm going to kind of go off uh, track. But the reason why our churches are empty or at least not as full as they used to be is because the generations, the younger generations, have seen the church in a bad light. And the only way they've seen it is because those of us that are in church are presented it that way. I guarantee you, if you walked into a restaurant and the chef was walking out talking about how dirty the kitchen was or bad the food is, you would think twice about going into that restaurant and eating. And this is the same way when people see us, those that have given our life to God and to Christ, leaving church, but our lives don't mimic what we claim to believe, our lives don't illustrate the love and faith in Christ that we declare, and it's turning them away from Christ. And many of our children, our grandchildren, our loved ones are not going to church, not because the preacher did something, but because we've allowed them to see something in us or something that we've displayed, something that we've shared, the way we presented the church has turned them away. Uh, So the same way we don't embrace behaviors and practices that are beneficial to us, we need to reject these spiritual practices that have no life, no place in the life of a believer. The Jewish elders were so set on having things work out the way they wanted that they would rather reject the Son of God and God's Word simply because it did not fit the narrative they were trying to paint. Instead of being sons of Abraham, uh, they revealed themselves as sons of the world and sons of sin. Now, going back to the main theme of this lesson, we are all in submission to something in this world. Whether we realize it or not, we are all in submission to something. Some of us submit to our desire for fame, for money, and for prestige and status. Some of us submit to our relationships, to our habits, to our addictions. Some of us allow the enemy to pervert our outlook and submit to our own selfish desires. But Jesus makes it clear. As the Son of God, he submits only towards the will of God and God's plan for his life. Again. God's way and God's plan is not always the easiest and most comfortable in the life of a believer, but it's the only plan that ends with eternal salvation and freedom from the consequences of our sins. Jesus boldly calls out these elders and lets them know that if they are not submitting to the word of God, 
and they are not children of God, and therefore must be children of this world, children of the enemy. There is no gray area. There is no space to be in the middle of the fence. Each and every one of us, we must wholeheartedly trust and believe in God and follow his word. We either are his children or we reject God and we become children of the enemy. The prayer of every Christian, my prayer, I, I, I pray it's your prayer, to be that we constantly hold ourselves up to the image of Christ. And by the aid of the Holy Spirit, make sure that all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our actions are of God and reflective of his word in our lives. There is no space for anything else in the life of a Christian. Either we submit to the will of God and we become God's children, or we reject the will of God and the word of God, or we become slaves of this world and slaves of sin. So that's how this lesson concludes. Just us outwardly and inwardly pondering is what I'm doing aligned with God's word. Is the life that I'm living aligned with the word of God, all my choices, my worries, my thoughts. And whatever it is that doesn't belong, we need to pray that God removes it. Now, there's an old song, and I hope I don't get these words right, but anyway, you bless me, I'll be satisfied. You can wipe the tears from my eyes and put joy inside. Any way you bless me, I won't complain. The power of your spirit said it would ease the pain. And so I know it's difficult. I know some of us are in painful situations right now. But God is still blessing us and God is still keeping us. And the fact that we're listening and sharing right now is reflective of the fact of just how richly God's blessings are abounding in our lives. So regardless of how difficult your situation might be, I would always rather be a house, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And that should be all of our prayers, that we would much rather have an uncomfortable road in Christ knowing where that road leads than to have a comfortable road outside of Christ and lead or end up in eternal damnation. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you for your presence, your prayers. As always, we are so blessed that you are choosing to share with us. We know that there are so many options, Christian education, Sunday school, Bible class, for preaching, or during this COVID pandemic, for each and every one of you that have shared with us, or even for those of you that have stumbled upon us for the first time, we thank you for your presence. And please continue to pray for us here on the west side of Chicago. If you would like to support the work we're doing here at Friendship, we do have four ways for you to give. You can give through the Cash app, dollar sign Friendship Chicago. You can give online on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462. We can always mail your check or money order to the church. Friendship, Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jetson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Uh, please join us in just a few moments in the 11 o'clock hour for our morning worship where our own pastor, Dr. Backus, will be sharing the gospel. Also, you can join us on Tuesday mornings at 8 a.m. for our prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. The phone number and access code is on your screen, but a few of God's prayer warriors just get together. We ask that God's will be done not only in the life of this church, in the life of this nation, and throughout all of creation. Also, we call the name of each and every person on our sick and Shut in list, praying that God just move in the lives, uh, in their lives and the lives of their family. And then also you can join us on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. for our Bible class, taught by our pastor, Dr. Back is currently going through the book of Romans, a wonderful illustration on what it means to be a Christian and the necessity of Christ and faith in the life of a Christian. So I thank you again for your presence. Prayerfully, we will see you next week at the same time. The Lord says the same. And I pray God's blessings continue to richly abound in your life. Let's dismiss in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, another opportunity to share in your word. Father, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to make the choice in our lives. We ask that you give us the strength to not choose the world and not choose our own selfish desires, but to choose your way, choose your will, to choose your word for each and every one of our lives. Thank you for our pastor, Dr. Backus. Thank you for our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams. Thank you for each and every instructor and student throughout this country. And most importantly, thank you for those that have shared with us today. Continue to bless us and enrich us according to your blessings and your purpose for our life. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless.